Hey, everybody, welcome back. He is the host of Cosmos and the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History. Please welcome back to a late show, America's favorite astrophysicist and teacher, I'd say, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil, good to see you again. Steven, it's, it's been too long, it's been too long. No, I, it, it has, it has. I threw, in, I threw in teacher because you're one of the greatest explainers that I know. You, could, you, you, make, you make not only learning, but the idea about learning interesting because you burn oh, with such you. passion for thank knowledge you. that you infect all, all <laughs> around you. You, you cough your knowledge at them and it, it aerosolizes and we breathe it in and we want to know more. We catch the fever. Neil Tyson. The contagion of learning, yes, okay. Now, the yeah. last time we were together was March 6th and we bugged out of this theater on March 12th. This is the last night, on March 12th, a week later, a little less than a week later. Last time you were on about the coronavirus, you said this. I'd be interesting if we all paid attention to what scientists say. Mm -hmm. Maybe the coronavirus will just blow on by. So, <laughs> Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson, how'd we do? <laughs> well, I, you know, had you asked me this a month ago, I would have given us maybe a C minus. Mm -hmm. But given that rates are, they're not only peaking, they're spiking, they're higher than ever before since the pandemic began. So I'd have to give it sort of an F plus. <laughs> so, but failure, oh, is such a great fa F plus, so failure, but extraordinarily so. <laughs> no, the plus part is there are many people who have new habits that they maintain. So you watch, we all wash our hands, not we all, many wash our hands more often. You know, you wash down the groceries, you do, you do what you, you exactly. <laughs> So, so once, so that, that's, I give it a plus okay. sign there. I think we have a new mental state, but the we is not everyone. And uh, so, you know, my family has been COVID free because we listen to medical professionals. That's the secret. That's, that's the secret. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to tell anybody that, but that's, mm -hmm. so that's really kind of all it takes. Mm -hmm. So I'm disappointed especially since we've all be become tribalized over this. Right. And, you know, the virus doesn't care what tribe you belong to, doesn't care who you have sex with, who you worship, what your skin color is, what side of a line in the sand you were born on. It can infect you simply because you are human. And my big disappointment is that we as humans didn't band together to fight the common enemy. The way that, like in, in the movies, when the aliens land, humans band together and put our differences aside. The virus is the alien. The, the, the vibe, this is a dry run for when the aliens come, excuse me, if the aliens come. You said when, you just <laughs> blew it. You blew your cover, Neil Tyson. <laughs> I, I wanna talk about, uh, let's talk about uh, the sky a little bit here. Halloween treat, uh, tomorrow's Halloween, blue moon tomorrow. What does blue moon mean again? Oh yeah, so it's the, if you can squeeze two full moons in a month, then the second of those full moons is called a blue moon. It, the, the idea that the term has been around for since the early 1800s, mm -hmm. and the moon doesn't actually blue. By the way, all the moons, all the full moons of the year have names. Oh. Some are familiar, like the harvest moon. Sure. You know, sure. And, and the moon in June, by the way, never gets too high in the sky, so it takes on sort of an amber sunset color the whole trip, and so that's called the honey moon. And so the, the June full moon is the honeymoon. So anyway, so the moon, it's a kind of fun cultural facts. Okay. So uh, if you're trying to squeeze it into a month, you need a longer month. So February is like out of luck here because yes. it'll never get a blue moon. Okay. Uh, more moon news. This week, researchers found water and ice on the moon. Two things. We'd already knew there was ice, right, on the south pole of the moon. Yeah, deep in the in the in the craters, with forgive me, where the sun don't shine, <laughs> the, the sure. crater rims Down can south. be high enough yep. so that the low sun casts a permanent shadow, and they're called cold traps. So if the moon is ever hit, when it's hit by comets and asteroids, water scatters onto the surface. If it lands in that cold trap, it's there for billions of years. If it lands anywhere else, the sun hits it; it evaporates away. But what they found is, if you still go to those polar regions, you don't have to be in the coal trap and still find this, this sort of, I don't want to call it a reservoir of, but a repository of water molecules in high quantity. 
So there's no, there's no skating rinks or anything. But mm -hmm. if you go there, you'll, you can, if you, you make a machine to do this, you can sift through the soils and gather out the water molecules. And you want to do that because otherwise you'd have to carry the water to the moon with you. And why do that if it's there waiting for you when you get there? So I, obviously we got to drink water, but why else do we need water up there? Oh, oh, well, so, okay, so <laughs> water, if you, if you build a little factory to make this happen, separate, H2O, remember it's H2O, yeah. separate the hydrogen from the oxygen, and once you do that, these two, if they ever recombine, give off energy. And you remember from chemistry, that would be called an exothermic reaction. So you can, the water you can drink, and you can use it as rocket fuel to get back. So it's in situ use of resources. Is any and of by this, the way, yes. it costs it cost $10,000 a pound to put anything in orbit. Yeah. And so it, NASA wants to send you with a bottle of Avion, it's $10,000. If I can mine that water in space, all right, and sell it to NASA for $9,000, they're <laughs> buying it. So there's a whole future economy, space on space. Is there any liquid water on the moon? Is there a chance for that, or is the vacuum too hard and it would just, you know, uh, Yeah, yeah, so no, away. good, Remember, remembering some chemistry for you there. Sure. So, no, no, the, with no atmospheric pressure, the water can't is not stable as a liquid. So, it, plus they're just sort of molecules there embedded in the soils. Okay. And so, but if it gets too hot, it will fly away. So it's that region around the craters. So there's more water than we thought. So, uh, okay, big day coming up. Uh, we, we, this, is, this is no surprise. Election Day is on Tuesday. You mentioned earlier this month, let me get this right up here. There you go. Neil Tyson warns asteroid could hit Earth the day before the election. Don't panic, you can still vote. I heard about this. I heard about this asteroid that's whizzing by on Monday. And John Stewart's freaked out about it, by the way. I told him I would ask you about this. What happens if it does hit? And what's the probability? Okay. All right, so first, it's about the size of a refrigerator. And so these are interesting and intriguing objects, but they're not dangerous to us. So even, by the way, when I tweeted about this, I didn't say it was going to hit. I say it may buzz cut us the day before. So that- Could hit Earth, you, that's in print, Neil, that's in print. <laughs> Could hit Earth. You call it, okay, you're calling a, the, the hill? The, oh, yeah. All right. There's, there's a one half of 1% chance that it will hit Earth. But even if it does, okay, it's going 25,000 miles an hour, about seven miles per second. That's booking. That speed, that's booking. That's booking. Totally booking. It's at least that speed because there's a close. That's the speed if it didn't otherwise have like an extra velocity coming in. So, so at 25,000 miles an hour, you hit Earth's atmosphere, it's like a brick wall. So it hits it and explodes, scatters into a zillion p pieces. Some of those rocks will reach Earth. And, but it'll be a, ver a quite visible explosion if, in fact, it hits. Visible in the sky. Sure. But it's not, and, and you might even hear a shockwave, but it's not going to hurt anybody. Nothing's going to, there's no damage. How there's not big? an excuse to not vote. How big? Okay. Good, good. Go vote, everybody. The all is not lost. How yeah. big, because you say the size of a refrigerator is not big yeah. enough to, like, penetrate all the way through and hit me on the head. How big Correct. does it have to be? Well, so the ones we really are worried about are the ones that are about a half a mile in uh, across. Sure. By the way, smaller than that will still hit the Earth, but they won't disrupt civilization. When you get to about a half a mile across, yeah. then you start doing things like disrupting the transportation grid because mm -hmm. it'll hit, cause fires. Th sure. So it, it, a full-up disaster, and that and up is, is where you really need to worry. And fortunately, the bigger asteroids are easier to detect. So we want to get a, as complete a catalog as we can to down to the smallest that we can. The problem is when they're little and they go away from us after they come near, we lose them. Yeah. And so we have to sort of project their orbit on it comes and then look for it on the on the backside on the way back. That's the problem with the election day asteroid. It was discovered two years ago. We only had a few days of its orbit in order to calculate the entire orbit, and then it went and got disappeared. Okay. So we should be recovering that any any minute now, actually. We have to take a quick break, Neil, but stick around, everybody. When we come back, I'm going to ask Neil deGrasse Tyson.